associate editor of Liberty. Thank you so much, sir, for joining this webinar. It's always a pleasure and privilege to have such strong words from the fraternity. Thank you so much. And I'm ending all the session with all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you for that warm introduction. And we'd like to thank Samarth Pharma for providing us this platform where we can discuss cutting edge uh, topics related to adrenal medicine. We are also grateful for this platform because we are able to connect with friends and colleagues from across the world. And today it's my proud pleasure to introduce our chairpersons, first of all. Let me introduce my teacher, my guru, Professor Sushil Jindal, who is professor of uh, medicine at People's Medical College in Bhopal. Sir has been instrumental in guiding ESI, Endocrine Society of India, in various positions. And he has also conducted the ESSICON, a very stellar ESSICON at Bhopal a few years ago. A warm welcome, sir. Thank you for being with us. I'd also like to introduce our friend from the Philippines. Dr. Mia Fajos is president of the Philippine Association for the Study of Overweight and Obesity. And she's promised to help me lose weight. If there is a president who leads by example, that is Dr. Mia. So thank you, madam, for being with us. She's also immediate past president of the Philippine Society of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism, which is a sister society of ESI, Endocrine Society of India. She currently serves as senior lecturer in molecular biology and biochemistry at the University of Philippines College of Medicine. Warm welcome, Mia. Uh, e welcome thank to you. India. We hope to have you with us uh, physically, maybe next year when all yeah. this COVID madness goes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being with us. I'd also like to introduce our third chairperson, Dr. Andrew Uloko. Dr. Andrew is a man, not of words, but of action. Apart from being professor of endocrinology at Bayoro University in Kano in Nigeria, he also does many secret things. For example, fighting terrorists, working for the United Nations. But his claim to fame, uh, most of you would know I am from a state in, uh, in India known as Haryana. Our language is Haryanvi. And in Haryanvi, we have a word called Andy. And Andrew's nickname is Andy. Andy means, there's no Hindi word, there's no English word for Andy. It means something like this, something special, something unique, something mm -hmm. exceptional. And, and I really cannot think of an English word for mm -hmm. Andy. I know the Punjabi word. The Punjabi word is can't. And there is a word from Eastern UP where they say dhimchuk. So that's what Andy is. He's Andy. But that's what Andy is. So welcome, Andy. Welcome, Andrew. And we look forward to having you with us. My pleasure. Thanks. This is a global uh, seminar. But the star of attraction today is one of our most dynamic endocrinologists. And I'm very happy to welcome to the high table, Dr. Sindhu. Dr. Sindhu is our speaker for today. She'll be presenting a case on adrenal medicine. She completed her DM in endocrinology from Narayana Medical College, Nellore. Her teacher is one of the most dynamic teachers in the country. Dr. Vijay Sarthi is someone whom we all like and respect. Currently, Dr. Sindhu is working as an endocrinologist at Apollo Institute of Medical Sciences and Research at Chittur in Andhra Pradesh. And Andhra Pradesh is one of our leading states, Andrew and Mia, in terms of education, in terms of endocrine care. So warm welcome, Sindhu. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. This is our star-studded galaxy for today. Dr. Jindal will be in charge. Dr. Mia and Dr. Andrew will be supporting. But the center stage now belongs to Sindhu, and rightfully so. So Dr. Sindhu, what will you be speaking to us about today? What case do you have for us? Uh, sir, I have two cases, actually. And case one goes with uh, exogenous uh, steroid abuse, like exogenous Cushing syndrome. Right. And the second case would be more interesting. Actually, it is something related to COVID and dexamethasone abuse. Okay. Uh, so is, there, is that a secret until you tell us? Just like uh, Andy is keeping Andy secrets from us? <laughs> now the secret is revealed. <laughs> <laughs> so carry on. Let's have the first case. And, yeah. and maybe uh, once your first case, disc, uh, case presentation is over, then Dr. Jindal sir will take a call on whether to have the discussion separately for each case or not. Dr. Jindal sir can take a call on that. Okay, sir. Okay. Yeah, right. Uh, you can share your screen now. Yeah. No, is it visible? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. My audio is okay now? Both yes, are sir. perfect. Yeah. Okay, sir. I will be starting. Uh, 
good evening all and today's topic for discussion is non adrenal use of steroids and i have two case presentations case presentation one this is a 46 year old female uh, she was referred from department of orthopedics uh, for her uh, colis fracture and uh, they identified her to have osteoporosis and so they referred to us for evaluation of osteoporosis going to her history she had history of difficulty in walking which she attributed to her bilateral knee joint pains and weakness of legs like uh, she attained the present fracture by slipping from stairs which were around two steps height and she had ain't fall on outstretched hand and uh, and attained the forearm fracture of right hand and going to the further history regarding weakness she attributed her weakness to be more of generalized and she had generalized myalgia as to weight gain she had history of weight gain since her last childbirth which was around 21 years back but she had loss of appetite for the past 5 years and so was her weight gain which was static she noted history of striae over her abdomen she noted history of thinning of skin and easy bruising of her skin over the past 4 years she didn't notice any mooning of face or thinning of limbs no history of any unwanted hair acne hyperpigmentation skin infections or history suggestive of any periodic paralysis she had symptoms of acid peptic disease and there were no history of symptoms suggestive of raised intracranial hypertension regarding vision she gave history of blurring of vision and glare there were no history of symptoms suggestive of thyrotoxicosis no history of any renal stones constipation polyuria she had history of mood disturbances and uh, her menstrual cycles uh, they were irregular Two to three days over forty over forty uh, five to fifty days. She was oligomenorrhic, and her diet was low in calcium, two fifty milligrams per day, and protein was also low, fifteen grams per day. And regarding her uh, illnesses, she had bilateral knee osteoarthritis over the past six years. She had hypertension over the past four years. She was diagnosed to have bipolar disorder over the past four years, and she is a uh, diabetic for three years. No other. any systemic illnesses or past history of any fractures and regarding medication history here comes something significant and relevant for the today's talk she was using over the counter painkillers which is of uh, notable frequency that is two to thrice per week and she was using local injections at the site of knee for her bilateral knee osteoarthritis from a quack and the frequency was for every 2 weeks and apart from that she was an amlodipine for hypertension a combo of metformin glimepiride for diabetes and escitalopram sertraline and clonazepam for her bipolar disorder and she uses uh, proton pump inhibitors and antacids also over the counter once or twice per week i have some special attraction especially for this quack he was very famous in my district and he is very famous for treating knee osteoarthritis and he treats only knee osteoarthritis he comes a while and goes i mean every 2 weeks is the regimen he advises to his patients this costs around 900 to 1200 see he treats only knee osteoarthritis and he gives the patients to come every 2 weeks he will be uh, doing some freelancing type of job along various places of my district and he has some secret injections for this knee osteoarthritis and it took a lot of time for us to find out what was a secret regime and later we found out it was a triple combination and the triple combination included diclofenac injection lignocaine injection and triamcinolone injection this was the combo he was using and this were the places where he used to inject this were the three spots he used to inject i am not sure whether he goes into intraarticular way or else he is giving subcutaneous depot or something and the above thing whether it is going to intramuscular or subcutaneous i am not sure but he has no degree and he has even no set up place he just does freelancing and goes with uh, various centers in the uh, in my town like uh, he has good number of patients and uh, they Uh, some uh, assistant of him gives phone uh, collects all the phone numbers of the patients and every two weeks they'll be getting calls and they'll go and get his treatment 
and uh, surprisingly she was also uh, one of the patient of this famous quack and on examination she was obese with a bmi of 33.4 kg per meter square and blood pressure was 134 by 84 on amlodipine 5 mg she had a uh, moon faces bitemporal fullness dorsal cervical pad of fat supraclavicular fullness bilaterally and acanthosis nigricans of grade 3 cataract was seen in both eyes on dilated examination striae was seen in lower abdomen with a vivid more than 1 cm wide and depressed her skin was thin little sign was positive and bruise were present on iv injection site when no any fungal infections hyperpigmentation acne or hirsutism she had significant proximal muscle wasting and power in her bilateral hips was 4 minus by 5 and uh, shoulder left was 4 by 5 right she had a cast and these were the striae and these were bruises i did i mean there were some concerns issued to show her face actually so i am showing only these two pics so finally this is a 46 year old perimenopausal obese woman with diabetes hypertension bipolar disorder bilateral knee osteoarthritis with history of exogenous steroid painkiller and ppi abuse presented with traumatic right forearm fracture had features of cushing syndrome suggestive of exogenous etiology on examination and these were her labs she was vitamin d deficient with a value of 40 nanogram per ml of 25 hydroxy vitamin d her alkaline phosphatase was a bit elevated and sugars were of borderline control and sgpt was elevated and she was uh, dyslipidemic with a total cholesterol of 346 and predominantly triglyceride rich this is her dexa we showed a lumbar l1 to l4 average of t score minus 4.5 and z score minus 2.8 and left femur uh, dexa t score was minus 3.0 and right it was minus 3.3 these are the dexa values she was osteoporotic and lumbar spine the z score was also minus 2.8 so in view of her uh, steroid abuse thought of doing some cortisol and actin prolongatum test to rule out any adrenal insufficiency her 8 am serum cortisol was 3.6 micrograms per deciliter and actin prolongatum stimulation test stimulated 60 minute serum cortisol was 11.8 micrograms per deciliter and this test was done 6 weeks after she attained fracture and one week after her local injection she didn't lose uh, contact with that guy and she was continuing that local injections even after attaining the fracture and surprisingly there were no history of episodes of any crisis maybe she was on constant level of her exogenous steroids or over the counter drug abuse uh, that had led to this significant history of no crisis episodes in the past and this is a x ray of her by both nip showing osteonecrosis uh, that is a new term for avascular necrosis hip it was more significant on the right side as you can see right side uh, both says there is significant uh, sclerosis seen and right side even there is flattening of uh, acetabulum flattening of the head of femur not acetabulum and there was cyst uh, suggestive of suggestive of necrosis and here also there are cyst and osteosclerosis and there is significant joint space narrowing so all these features uh, suggestive of osteonecrosis of both femoral heads and we had an ophthal consultation because she had some blurring of vision and glare and there was some uh, evidence of cataract seen on uh, torchlight examination and uh, the expert opinion from ophthalmologist revealed a posterior subcapsular cataract of grade p4 in both eyes and intraocular pressures with the uh, goldman aplanation tonometry was 24 mm on right eye and left eye it was 22 mm they consider less than 18 to 20 as normal so she had both glaucoma and cataract and this was the slit lamp examination of the same patient showing posterior subcapsular cataract 
so the final diagnosis of her was she was a case of exogenous cushing syndrome with secondary adrenal insufficiency type 2 diabetes hypertension osteoporosis with callus fracture and right forearm vitamin d deficiency bilateral hip osteonecrosis obesity dyslipidemia non alcoholic state of hepatitis both eyes cataract and glaucoma acid peptic disease bipolar disorder and perimenopause so we advised her on stress day management we started her on 1400 kilo calorie diet and muscle strengthening exercises were advised and tablet hydrocortisone was started at a total dose of 20 mg divided as 10 mg at 7 am immediately after awakening 5 mg at noon and 5 mg at 5 5 pm that is around 4 hours before her sleep she was started on vitamin d cholecalciferol 60000 units every week for 8 weeks and calcium carbonate 500 mg bd and telnicliptine was added for her glycemic control at 20 mg od she was started on statins at or was statin 10 mg and we advised her to stop over the counter painkillers and strictly the quack treatment and go ahead with ultraset tablet or paracetamol 1000 mg whenever she has this pains which were unbearing and we clearly explained about her axis suppression and the adrenal crisis episodes which she may encounter if the steroids were suddenly stopped and which she continues the steroids what were the adverse effects of her health from tip to toe all this were seriously counseled for her and the plan was to start zolintonate after correcting her vitamin deficiency for her osteoporosis and also for her osteonecrosis which was of grade 3 which recommends a medical management and this is the case 1 can i go to case 2 or else uh, should sindhu, i stop sindhu, here uh, sindhu will like to discuss this first because after second case we may forget uh, some parameters of this patient okay, so it so will be better so uh, will you start discussing this case or should we open it for uh, questions uh, we can have discussion you and dr mia and this is okay for me sir yeah if you and dr mia and dr andrew you can just have a friendly discussion around this and in the meantime we see if there are any questions from the audience regarding this particular uh, case and once that is done we can move on to case 2 Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sanjay. Uh, Dr. Sindhu, that was an excellent um, case presentation, and uh, this mirrors what we encounter quite often in endocrine practice in the environment, where people use uh, medications that uh, have impact on endocrine function, and in this case, the adrenal glands are suffering because um, some quark is injecting intra. Articular uh, steroids, but having said that, um, I thought in this discussion we are going to also allude to the fact that we have quite a number of colleagues in rheumatology that do intra-articular injection of steroids, and uh, quite often um, I don't know if we are looking in that direction uh, in terms of um, collaborating with us and to have a proper uh, assessment of the patient while these intra-articular uh, injections are given. I'm not um, trying to fault what colleagues in rheumatology are doing, but I think that um, it's, um, it's quite um, apt that we should collaborate with them. It should be multi-center kind of management. My second comment is that um, it will appear as though these patients um, uh, comorbidities are quite many. And would you say then that um, she just has type 2 diabetes, uh, essential hypertension? Um, my, one of my hypotheses for this patient would be that she's got obesity, she's got hypertension, she's got type 2 diabetes, she's got dyslipidemia. These are entities of the metabolic syndrome. Now, whether this diabetes is type 2 is another issue for discussion because um, the use of steroids, uh, even though intra-articular, has produced systemic effects, which is now manifesting in the hypercortisolemic state. Um, are we really dealing with steroid side effects that has resulted in diabetes, that has resulted in hypertension, uh, dyslipidemia, and even the pathological fracture that she has sustained? 
these are some of the entities that I think uh, will be good to elaborate on so that uh, we can actually truly classify a type of diabetes. Are we dealing with type 2 diabetes or we are dealing with other specific types of diabetes? In this case, the drug-induced kind of diabetes and drug-induced hypertension. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Okay, Mia? Um, yeah. Yes. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sindhu, for that presentation. And um, um, in teaching our fellows, we always focus on the history. So I have a, a lot of questions about the history, and I agree with Dr. Andrew earlier who was actually um, asking whether this is really type two diabetes or probably steroid induced diabetes. And you might probably get that based on the history if these were taken um, uh, more in depth, no? So I need to know what, um, what age she had her menarche. First of all, this patient has been having her steroid injections in the knee because she has been having pain. So why does she have pain? Is she, um, did she already have um, knee problems before uh, because of any other um, illness? Like is she, was she obese prior to this um, occurrence? Prior, that's why she had um, osteoarthritis of both knees. Next is I need to know her uh, menarche. Um, did she have regular or irregular menses even before this illness maybe she she's also uh she also has polycystic ovary syndrome for all we know that's why she has this problem she has metabolic syndrome as well and um yeah you say that she is uh, perimenopausal but then of course um you also mentioned her irregularity of menses also the bipolar disorder if she was diagnosed with that four years ago we would like to know if she was on medication because definitely uh, medications for bipolar disorders can cause irregular menses, weight gain, insulin resistance. So those are some of the things that I would like to know. Also, um, she has been having, yes, definitely she has been having injections with triamcinolone. Um, how many injections did she acquire? Did she get? So, and I'm, I'm uh, also another thing for the proton pump inhibitors. Um, she had acid peptic uh, ulcer disease. Uh, this could also cause osteoporosis. So I just want to know all of these things. I'm sorry, I have a lot of questions, but that's how we do it. <laughs> yeah, regarding the history of uh, menarche i'm not sure i didn't just ask about the menarche history and uh, regarding her menstrual history they were irregular over the past four years as of what she told and uh, diabetes was there for the past three years this bipolar mm. disorder yes she was on all these three medications for the past four years and the history was like uh, she had recurrent depressive disorder that was diagnosed prior to this bipolar disorder, it seems. Mm -hmm. And later she progressed to bipolar disorder and she was added this uh, sertraline and clonazepam over the past four years. And prior, she was only on acetalopram. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding other questions. How many injections she had? How many injections? Like uh, we were unable to know the dose what he was giving. They told like uh, they were uh, supposed to get this vial. So he was giving that one ml injection and it frequency was every two weeks. Yeah. Like these injections she was taking over the past three years. Mm -hmm. For this and the over-the-counter painkillers also when we went into specific history of that they were uh, like she was an Hyphenac, like uh, it was a cyclophenac, that is NSAID, and at time she was on Dexona too. So there was steroid abuse o in both oral and intraarticular forms for her. See, like dosage or the cumulative dose, uh, we were unable to quantify because uh, that was a vague history. Like she wasn't able to say definitely how many tablets every week or else every month she was on. It was like at times a cyclophenac and at times uh, Dexona. But she stopped Dexona over the past two years. 
mm-hmm. and these over the counter painkillers she was using over the past 6 years maybe she had that oral uh, steroid abuse prior for the 4 years and this local intraarticular steroid abuse for the past 3 years and the dose was 1 ml of this transylon shot 40 mg and pcod her cycles were regular uh, from menarche to 4 years prior this irregularity was from 4 years only and uh, other PPIs, yes, that was a significant history, and that could have been a contributory factor for her osteoporosis. It's something um, multifactorial. It was uh, because of her steroid abuse, and also because of her uh, proton pump inhibitor abuse. And diabetes, I also feel she was obese female. Like uh, from her last childbirth, she had a persistent weight gain. Mm-hmm. so she could have attained uh, this metabolic syndrome related issues and this steroid abuse could have added her, her uh, diabetic glycemic status right i don't feel like to attribute uh, these diabetes to only steroids i feel like mm-hmm. metabolic syndrome component is also there for her mm-hmm. and okay, other yes, questions I... ma'am did i miss anything i now that you've answered everything and um So Good I'm uh, I'm impressed that you actually considered um, adrenal insufficiency at the outset. Why did you consider this? Since um, your patient already had yeah Cushing's um, Cushing's uh, symptoms or oh, sorry fasces and all, and her blood pressure was um, on the higher side. And how about the sodium and the creatinine? How were they? Because you were planning to give the patients allodronic acid. Um, electrolytes the were missed here, and the creatinine was one point one. Okay. The sodium is. Uh, the sodium potassium was not done in this yeah. patient. Yeah. That so that's a first it. thing that we also look for in a yeah, patient yeah. with Cushing's, right? Should have been done. Mm-hmm. Doctor Sandhu, just. Uh, so, So it becomes sometimes necessary to give the patients uh, chronic uh, corticosteroid uh, doses. Suppose some patient has undergone uh, kidney transplant or some other transplant. So how can we avoid uh, these complications? Can alternate day therapy with shorter acting steroids help uh, in this situation? Yes, sir. Regarding the axis suppression, which is a major concern, along with the metabolic effects of steroids, there are certain factors which influences. First, the type of steroid, the dose of steroid, duration of steroid, cumulative dose of steroid, and also the timing of the steroid which we use, associated conditions for which the steroid is being used, and some associated medications. Coming to the dosage, maybe longer-acting steroids like dexamethasone and betamethasone uh, have long uh, axis suppression compared to the intermediate and short-acting ones, like hydrocortisone is short-acting one, and intermediate-acting or this methylprednisolone, trimethylone, and prednisolone, and longer-acting or dexan beta. Maybe dexan beta will have a prolonged HP axis suppression, and one. one note in endotext uh, has given like uh, they compared you know like uh, we have this comparison of various steroids for this mineralocorticoid and glucocorticoid potency comparing with cortisol and this article has given this hp axis uh, suppression effects also they have given like this intermediate acting steroids um, both methylprednisolone prednisolone triamcinolone have the hp axis suppression to the point of 4 whereas dexamethasone has 17 times uh, axis suppression which is something significant so this is regarding the type of steroids maybe the route of administration obviously systemic route will have a better bioavailability so the better suppression regarding other routes uh, uh, even topical nasal inhalational all have some uh effects be- based on their systemic absorption regarding topical there's some ointments of better absorption rather than creams and all those and regarding uh, timing especially giving steroid uh, to the maximum dose in morning times comparing to that given evening times when you give steroid a more dose in evening times more the axis suppression like acth will be suppressed more uh, around 8 am so that's one point and uh, cumulative doses also make a point like 5 grams cumulative doses have uh, a risk of osteoporosis uh, more they say and uh, root also some articles have given like dose and duration 
is very much individually variable. Uh, they didn't confine themselves to a specific dose, but some have given like 7.5 mg dose equivalent of prednisolone given for three weeks will have access suppression. And for inhalational, 1000 mg fluticasone given for three weeks could have access suppression. But uh, most articles say that this is something variable, the dose and duration thing. And uh, concomitant medications also influence because these steroids are metabolized by cytochrome B450. Enzyme uh, inhibitors, when we use, also may prolong the steroid use. And uh, especially the concomitant conditions which they have been using, they are used for some inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis. The underlying inflammatory disease could also contribute, especially in our present case, for the osteoporosis. So... To decrease the effects, maybe we can go for short-acting steroids, one point, and dosing as much low as possible. And three, going for alternate day dosing or split dosing with the lowest dose given in the evening time. And five, checklist on the enzyme inhibitors to just maximum avoid those enzyme inhibitors and regular monitoring. Maybe these factors could avoid the effects if steroid use is uh, inevitable in the cases. Otherwise, it's better to stop. It said that uh, the immunosuppressive action of shorter acting steroids lo lasts longer than their metabolic and axis suppression acting. So probably giving them alternate uh, days, uh, suppose prednisolone is given on alternate days in morning hours, Will not that help the patient if, it, she, if she needs it for a, a long duration of time? Suppose there is a patient with some transplant program or something. Yes, sir. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, dosing uh, frequencies also yes. do definitely matter. Evening high doses will definitely suppress the thing. And giving morning high doses will definitely be helpful. Yeah. Any questions from audience? Huh. I see a question and says uh, there's... there's how long steroid was given? She has already answered. What was the history of uh, the diabetes hypertension? What was the history of, uh, are they earlier before the steroid abuse or they occurred after you have already answered? And uh, Dr. Usman Ibrahim, how do you, you intend uh, treating her? You are still giving her steroids to help her access, but uh, what can we, we do with the Cushing syndrome? and its consequences. Yes, Sindhu? Sir, I didn't uh, get the question. You, uh, regarding uh, the steroid use? How do you intend to uh, treat her? You yeah. are still giving steroids to help her uh, access, but uh, what can we do with the uh, Cushing syndrome and its consequences? This is Dr. Usman Ibrahim, he has asked like this We question. are giving steroids in this case because her access oh, is suppressed uh, yes. and yes. Uh, yes. we don't know how long it takes for her access to recover. Taking steroids for a duration of about four to six years mm -hmm. is a bit long one. Long. And uh, I don't even expect her uh, recovery in a span of uh, one year also because these type of patients could cross even one year for their access to recover. And these steroids are replacement doses because her access is suppressed to the extent of 3.6 basal is too low. Hello. So these are replacement doses, which are life-saving for these patients. And these are not uh, uh, supra-physiological. These are physiological and must be given. And stress advice is also advised so to double or triple her doses during stress periods. And regarding her comorbidities, the major comorbidity here was osteoporosis and uh, fracture, which she was referred to us. And yes, because um, before starting anti-osteoporotic treatment, uh, we need to, I mean, the plan was to start zolindronic acid because her uh, vitamin D was very low. We thought of replenishing her first with vitamin D and have some calcium, good diet and uh, supplements. And after uh, normalization of vitamin D, yes, we were planning to start oral bisphosphonates. Other comorbidities are uh, seriously entertained and uh, regarding comorbidities for the attendee asked. Diabetes, okay, we added telmigliptine, hypertension, borderline control, AVN also because it was of grade 3 variety, bisphosphonates could help. Yeah. Like if it is of greater variety, if it is progressing, then we go for uh, initially joint sparing surgeries like osteotomies or uh, core decompressions and later. But for this case, that would suffice. 
dyslipidemia we added statin and cataract and glaucoma the ophthalmologist added some prostaglandin or like trevopost for glaucoma and they planned uh, surgery for one eye only apd mm. maybe other uh, h2 receptor blockers could be better ppd mm, it was under control only i can say like the patient was a bit low when i talked to her maybe i can refer her to have some review of medication to a psychiatrist so this how the comorbidities were managed any specific questions sir still regarding comorbidities i think we have finished all the questions in the in the question I, answer i i i i have something to add sorry um yes, yes. um maybe someone would like to ask this though um when do you consider tapering down steroid uh, for any patient who has taken steroids for more than 3 weeks you are supposed to taper the dosage down maybe alternating dose for this patient i'd like to ask finally um when do you start uh when do you repeat your test for adrenal insufficiency whether um your uh tapering down is already adequate and it's time to discontinue yeah, regarding the first question of how to taper the steroids like uh, physiological dose of steroids is equivalent to prednisolone of uh, 5 to 7.5 mg per day yes. so when the patient is taking an equivalent of prednisolone more than 7.5 mg per day for more than 3 weeks we have to taper it slowly like you can taper it at the rate of 2.5 mg per day every 3 to 4 weeks and then gradually 1 mg per day for again 3 to 4 weeks and 1 mg per day till your physiological dose is reached or else for better doses uh, reduction you can convert the same to hydrocortisone like 20 mg uh, hydrocortisone is equal into 5 mg prednisolone you can convert it and you can then gradually reduce by 2.5 mg every week till you reach 10 mg and you can continue that 10 mg for 2 to 3 months and then check for the excess thing and the second question about the present case how do i assess her adrenal sufficiency or excess recovery uh maybe i will go for her basal cortisol levels in the same way uh when it is less than 3 i will not even go for this uh, okay first of all what she is, is on high zone i mean she is on hydrocortisone right that has some interference with the assay so i can either convert it to dexa dexa doesn't interfere with assay first thing and second thing i can skip the morning dose of hydrocortisone get the test done and then give her hyson that may not interfere that say when will uh, you do the adrenal insufficiency tests for this case maybe every 3 months interval 3 months i don't feel like she'll be recovering so early to at least 6 months i think i think 6 <laughs> months is a good option for her <laughs> okay so sindhu uh, yeah. probably we are running out of time so you please go on to your next case sure sir so this is a case 2 yeah this is a 34 year old uh, male a software engineer works in bengaluru he presented to me on june 2019 with a hba1c of 6.0 which was uh, came out after her his general check up and he was pre diabetic with a bmi of 30.6 kg per meter square i advised him dietary and lifestyle modifications which he was ready to take up on february 2020 after span of about 8 months he lost 12 kg which was very much appreciable his bmi came down to 26.13 and his uh, blood glucose values came to 96 and 124 the fasting was in upper normal but it was low and he wished to continue his dietary and lifestyle changes so it was good enough and later came this lockdown due to covid we had lockdown at our own march 23rd in india and the software engineers uh, came were uh, advised to work from home so this did guy also worked from home and working from home also increased his dietary intake and on july 16th he came to me and he gained 5.8 kg and he attributed it to his lax diet control and sugars cross the borders and he also had a history of losing one of his family members due to Uh, to covid two weeks back it was his uh, maternal grandmother he stays with his maternal grandmother and father he was advised metformin but he wished to follow his lifestyle changes 
strictly as prior and uh, told like he will get down his sugars and uh, didn't want to take medications okay fine this was what happened till july 16th and this very lapsed like june he was pre diabetic with uh, and on feb with eight months duration he had better control and july again it shooted up to over diabetes and on september 4th he stays in my neighborhood only i got a call from neighbors like uh, this particular patient had a complaint of fever breathlessness and was drowsy so he was admitted to hospital suspecting him to be covid and few of these neighbors who called me were worried being his contacts like they wanted to know whether his suspicion was true to test themselves and be away from their family members i had a chance to speak to the intensivist of the covid hospital they told like he was admitted to icu suspecting him to be covid and uh, vitals he was hypotensive and tachycardic his glasgow coma scale was 7 by 15 but he was not requiring any oxygen support externally and his saturations were around 98% and he gave me a brief uh, investigation list which they did uh, immediately on his admission both rapid antigen test was negative rt pcr was awaited regarding covid radiological investigations chest ct was normal there was no abnormality detected x ray was normal total counts were a bit elevated dc neutrophils were elevated lymphocytes were low and the ratio was 3.6 this made them much more suspicious of covid like they had a cut off of 3.5 or more and to start steroids his esr and crp were elevated he had severe metabolic acidosis his liver enzymes were elevated blood urea was normal creatinine was elevated again and so they put a diagnosis of covid-19 with sepsis and multi organ dysfunction syndrome started him on fluid nutrition support and they added steroids so everyone had some fascinating thing after uh, recovery trial so they thought like uh, being his esr crp elevated that was their institute protocol to start steroid based on these reports they started and they have added on some antivirals azithromycin and heparin too so his bp improved but his uh, conscious remained same and the point to note was he was not requiring any oxygen support his saturations were normal the suspected encephalopathy due to covid they ordered even mri brain it was normal his electrolytes was mildly hyponatremic and uh, potassium uh, with sodium of 132 and potassium was in upper normal so they were awaiting for another set of investigations that may guide their further management of covid like d dimer ferritin ldh procalcitonin il6 and inflammatory markers this was the story till now maybe we are missing anything in this patient was any investigation missed yes yeah thank you can we comment now <laughs> i just i should it a basic investigation blood glucose was missed in this patient dr andrews want to uh, have some comments sir you yeah yeah i i thought she had done she was done with the case presentation but she could go ahead let's not finish she is not blood. finished but if if you can uh, make some differential diagnosis at this point yeah obviously it appears the patient had the diabetes ketoacidosis which was missed and uh, the treatment given um is not addressing the patient's problem so i'm not surprised that the patient still remains comatose despite uh, the other treatment they are giving and um, like she has rightly projected in her last slide uh vital investigation like uh, simple blood glucose measurement was not uh reported in the last cocktail of uh, laboratories that uh, was shown and i was wondering that um at the second contact in uh february 2020 and then uh in september 2020 there was no ay uh, like it's a more globin recordings for yeah. us to see how it compares with the, the the initial one i have a few other comments but i think she should finish sindu go on please yes sir like the blood glucose was missed uh, i don't know the specific reasons because they have some pattern of investigations to be done immediately after the patient gets admitted to this covid hospitals but they miss blood glucose anyways 
and it was a 404 uh, blood glucose which was whooping high and the ketones were positive of course he was managed for dka of course after a lapse of about 8.5 hours after his admission his gcs improved he was accepting well orally by day 2 by day 3 he was shifted to isolation room from icu they still considered him to be covid covid diagnosis was still considered and uh, apart from premix insulin he was also given this linsi uh, vitamin c because of that the multivitamin b complex medrol methylprednisolone and he had uta for which norfloxacin 400 mg bd for 3 days was given and meanwhile his rt pcr came out to be negative for covid and the course of steroids which they have given this is their uh, protocol for covid patients uh, it was given iv at the dose of 75 mg on day 1 and day 2 day 3 from day 3 it was converted to parol paroral preparation paroral routes and it was tapered as the dose given day 3 48 4 day 4 32 day 5 16 and day 6 and 7 it was 8 mg per day they was they were not convinced like he was not covid and still they continued it and he was in isolation ward for 14 days maybe he could have discharged yesterday or something i am not in i didn't even contacted him so for day 1 and day 2 he was on insulin infusions in icu and day 3 he was converted to premix insulin uh, there seemed to be lot of hypos during this conversion period and they weren't comfortable with premix insulin and they shifted him to sliding scale insulin based on sugars they used to give the dose this was the management they followed and uh, the question is what made his blood glucose to jump from the value of 212 to 404 covid i am not literally convinced he has this covid related diabetes so I had a chance to uh, i mean i'm not convinced with covid related diabetes so I had a chance to converse it with him on day 7 so his father was also diagnosed with covid and he was on mechanical ventilation he lost his grandmother and he ha- he developed some extreme fear of this covid 19 mortality he was surveyed only by his father and grandmother so he started some home treatment for covid 19 like uh, ginger teas and all herbal things and also included certain medications after consulting a local physician and most often he he took this treatment consulting his friends and social media also had a huge influence so what were these medications these were the three medications she was taking vitamin c chewable tablets and same b complex and dexona that is dexamethasone tablets and that was a beautiful regime someone has advised him 0.5 mg tablets two tablets tid thrice a day that equals to about 3 mg per day Yes, he was an oral dexamethasone, two to three mg per day for the past two weeks. He used to at times skip his night dose, and that came out to two mg per day. So I thought this is a steroid induced, not induced because he already was a type two diabetic. His sugars crossed the borderline. Steroid exacerbated type two diabetes, and I thought of ruling out secondary adrenal insufficiency, suspecting his hypotension initially, which he reported could be a part of adrenal crisis. Of course, DKA-related dehydration could have also been caused. Oh, when I encountered him uh, and asked him some history, he complained of only fatigue. There was no complaints of postal giddiness or nausea or vomiting. His blood pressures were one twenty-four by seventy-six mm Hg. and postural drop of systolic blood pressure was only 8 mm his sodium was 139 and potassium was 4.8 his atm serum cortisol on day 9 was 17.6 micrograms per deciliter it was around 48 hours after his last dose of methylprednisolone so i thought he was not his access wasn't sur- suppressed even with the maximum dose of prednisolone that equates for this dexamethasone could be around 30 uh, 20 mg right that was very high dose but still his access was not suppressed it was quite maintained well maybe is lucky or this uh, boils down to the fact like dose and duration of steroids have very high individual variability in causing access suppression so factors that led to this mix up of him using this dexamethasone where his fear of mortality due to covid and extensive propaganda of dexamethasone as a magic drug for covid-19 by quacks and 
some qualified doctors too in social media and misinterpretation of steroid use in covid-19 and cost and availability the availability of dexamethasone over the counter is very much uh, in india and the cost is very low for that tablet so this is a article that is a recovery trial which has uh, uh, conclusions have clearly mentioned that dexa has a mortality benefit in patients receiving only invasive ventilation but not among those receiving no ventilatory support the guidelines are clearly mentioning the same but the social media doesn't stop right they they have given like good news has come and that is the dexamethasone which is a life saving drug a magic drug which can save lives there came who which showed like to limit how much social media news you consume and avoid rumors and misinterpretation by getting news from these sources and regarding dexona also they told like it should not be stockpiled or used for mild disease that is people not requiring oxygen support in view of a serious side effects when not used properly but still somehow this patient uh, used this dexa and that would have caused his sugars to shoot up this was a nice pick i found june 20 dexamethasone could be effective against covid-19 and people use it on june 21 they present with exogenous cushing syndrome maybe uh, exogenous cushing is also has some morbidity issues but what about stopping this uh, altogether when the drug runs out of stock all may present with adrenal insufficient and significant mortality so this is a serious issue which uh, as endocrinologists we must educate the public i feel like this pick must go more viral to stop this measure and thank you this was the case okay sindhu very nice case uh, can dr sanjay come in for any comments uh, dr sanjay if you are available no probably has left so uh, <laughs> Uh, so this was a very nice case, and uh, we keep seeing such uh, uh, recommendations, which are not uh, uh, actually with with the caution that it should only be used in uh, patients who are already on ventilator, and uh, people uh, they are so fearful that uh, whatever comes in lay press or on the social media, they start following it. And unfortunately, these drugs, uh, dexamethasone, is uh, very easily available. actually a dictum is that unless proved otherwise every case of cushing's in india should be first diagnosed as exogenous cushing <laughs> because <laughs> it's so common uh, to have uh, exogenous cushing uh, that uh, we need to first exclude it before jumping on to the investigations for endogenous cushing so any comment uh, dr mia if you would like to make some comment yeah. I'd like to congratulate Dr. Sindhu for taking proper history. The the patient was admitted without the proper history and um, lacking a lot of laboratory tests. And we actually enjoyed. We actually are uh, together with you. We have a lot of those cases. Uh, dexamethasone being also used as a vitamin for. increasing the weight of our some of our patients who look malnourished so that's one of the things it's a wonder drug in our country as well and for our covid patients sometimes we give um uh dexamethasone at a low dose because it's also part of the recommendation at a low dose with the remdesivir if the patient is included in a study in a trial um among patients who in on high flow nasal cannula um not yet ventilated but um going to the severe case of covid as well so um, as the recovery that, trial also state that if they are requiring oxygen support also it yeah. it can be recommended not only yeah. invasive ventilation even oxygen yeah. alone also it's available so there, over the counter in your country also ma'am dexamethasone yeah. Ah uh, yes, it is. It's actually a vitamin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, ah uh, we we also have our traditional herbalists in some provinces, in some communities. So in your earlier case where there's a quack injecting, we have those too here. 
So it was we a have very busy quacking fact, very long yeah. list of patients. And they get a good rich. Amount of <laughs> they get rich. They get paid. <laughs> so they sell also dexamethasone from their homes. So that's what you, that's what they they do. And some of them actually get them from the internet online. Dexamethasone. Yeah. Doctor Andrew, uh, would you like to have some uh, addition to any? Uh, you can, yeah. can you have some comment? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I must congratulate uh, Dr. Sindhu for this excellent case summary. It, uh, it speaks of uh, what we see in day-to-day -day practice, uh, the use of steroids uh, wrongly applied to patient situations. Um, if, for this particular case, we have seen how the patient progressed gradually from a pre-diabetic state to uh, normal okay. glucose tolerance, and then he lapsed back into full-blown diabetes, uh, occasioned by the lockdown and the absence of physical activity and the lifestyle measures, which helped him tremendously. We have also seen that uh, because of the hype and the loud noise about COVID, any breathlessness is misunderstood as COVID. Yeah. Any fever is misunderstood as COVID. And I tell you our experience is that quite a number of patients of ours with diabetes have died of diabetes related complications, not of COVID. And they never really have COVID. Well, of course, we, uh, about two, three months ago in Nigeria, anybody with history of fever, uh, anything that has to do with breathlessness, most hospitals reject because they think it is COVID and then these patients bear the brunt and they actually die, unfortunately. Now we have seen um, PCR results negative in this patient. Nonetheless, the managing health institution still went ahead to give prednisolone, to give steroids. Uh, and then we have also seen the patient on his own for fear of mortality of COVID was taking uh, steroids on his own before the time of confinement. But what stands out that is quite uh, worrisome is the fact that this patient had diabetes ketoacidosis and this very important diagnosis was missed. And it is because a very basic test like blood sugar measurement, blood glucose measurement was not done. And I don't know what the experience is in India but in Nigeria, we insist that every health facility should have at least a blood glucose meter if you do not have a, a full-scale laboratory backup to measure blood glucose uh, values. Yeah, very beautiful results were shown, but blood glucose result was missed. We don't know if this contributed to the eventual outcome. Uh, I thank Dr. Sindhu and her team for intervening at the right time for doing the needful as it concerns diabetes ketoacidosis and for um, managing the steroid abuse or steroid use inadvertently. But this speaks to the reality of what we see on a daily basis. And uh, dexamethasone is very cheap and it's over the counter in Nigeria. And people use it for all sorts of uh, uh, reasons, uh, including um, uh, beauty, beautifying, uh, weight gain, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's a very instructive case summary, and um, I must congratulate you. It, it looks quite similar to our experience here. Thank you. So thank you, Sindhu. We really enjoyed, and these were this was a very good learning session, and I hope all the participants must be very happy listening to these two cases, and they must have learned something. I again congratulate you and we have thank already you, finished our time. So let me thank uh, Dr. Mia, Dr. Andrew, and uh, also Dr. Sanjay Kalra for uh, uh, making these type of webinars possible, which are more interactive and more um, uh, rather practical and day-to-day -day problems, which we come across. So thank you everybody. And uh, with this, uh, let's say goodbye. And uh, we really enjoyed your session. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you. all. Thank you, Dr. Uh, you. Sushil Jindal. So at last, I would like Thank to give you. the vote of thanks, sir, to everybody. Uh, respected doctors, very good evening once again. It has been a very informative and interactive session on topic on non-adrenal use of adrenal steroids. My gratitude to Dr. Sanjay Kalra for helping and guiding us for organizing